Good afternoon. Uh, I am Dr. Mascaram Gabrak Zaber, Assistant Clinical Professor and the Director of Inclusion and Community Engagement in the School of Human Evolution and Social Change at Arizona State University. Um, I feel incredibly privileged to be able to provide timely and important programming such as today's lecture amidst the acutely challenging moment we're all currently living through. And I want to thank all of you for joining us. Um, welcome to the second lecture of our new colloquium series titled Toward a Liberatory Theory and Praxis. Um, this monthly series aims to highlight the work of contemporary scholars belonging to identities and traditions marginalized within mainstream Western academic uh, academia who through their work confront neo-colonial power structures and challenge long-standing norms of knowledge production. Um, it was born out of a demand from our graduate students for exposure to more critical scholarship and uh, that is relevant to their lived experiences and the times in which we are living. Um, specifically, I would like to thank Nalubega Ross, Anais Roque, Tisa Lowen, and Aliyah Hoff, uh, some of our graduate students who worked with me uh, to conceptualize the series and establish its parameters. Uh, I also would like to thank, uh, to acknowledge Shesk leadership for supporting and sponsoring this series, specifically our unit director, Dr. Chris Stojanowski, um, who is also joining us today. Um, we will have um, one more speaker this fall, Dr. Uh, Michelle Tejas from University of Arizona, scheduled for November 18th at the same time. Um, and we will also be hosting four more speakers in the spring. So please uh, be on the lookout for more information on those talks as they become available in the coming months. Um, before I introduce our wonderful speaker today, I want to cover a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, please note that this event will be or is being recorded. Um, you, the audience, will not be visible and all of your mics will be off. Uh, but do note that after the talk, we will have, uh, we'll be leaving time for questions. And we're asking that you write your questions in the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Um, and I will be helping our guest, guest speaker track the questions and select which ones she will answer. Um, if you would like to ask the question yourself rather than have me read it out, please write in parentheses, ask live um, at the end of your question when you submit it in the Q&A button. And then when it's time for you to ask your question, we can unmute you. Um, all right, so without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today's speaker, Dr. Marissa Elena Duarte. Dr. Duarte is Pascuayaki and Chicana. She is an assistant professor in the School of Social Transformation here at ASU, and her 2017 book, Network Sovereignty, Building the Internet Across Indian Country, is about how tribes uh, whose command over internet infrastructure and regula regulation strengthens the power of native nations to enforce tribal sovereignty. Her recent work includes socio-technical and network analytic investigations of indigenous digital tactics towards decolonial resistance. She teaches courses in justice theory, indigenous methodologies, and learning technologies for native education through the School of Social Transformation. Her talk today is titled Activating Indigenous Feminist Networks for Change. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Duarte. Welcome. Thank you. Um, let me see if I can gracefully pull up my slide deck, <laughs> do the share screen thing. Let's see here. Okay. All right. Can you see that? Okay. So um, this is the overview of the talk. <laughs> I like to put it all on the, you know, up front so that um, you can see where we're going because um, I am going to um, sort of insert some personal stories and experiences into um, this particular presentation. And so um, I don't want you to think, oh, geez, she's just rambling. She's off topic. She's at a tangent. It very much relates to the, you know, this, this concept, you know, of what is um, indigenous feminist liberatory praxis. And the kind of praxis that I engage in has to do with digital media. So, okay, so my name is Mariselena Duarte Tosai Kavai. I put in Tosai Kavai White Horse. That is the um, name of my, um, my mother's mother. 
She's a member of the Pascoyaki tribe. I'm a member of the Pascoyaki tribe. I have a very large family. Um, but my father is Mexican American from the city of South Tucson originally. And so I'm also um, Chicana and was raised in that um, tradition as well. So the super overview of this talk is basically, in a nutshell, as indigenous matriarchs who work toward our people's liberation, we, these are the bullet points, find meaning in our ancestral histories and philosophies, relate and build networks of kin with other indigenous thinkers and their families, co-create systems of knowledge to overthrow and challenge colonial structures, cultivate subversive lucidity everywhere we walk, and insist on the dignity of a holistic and relational pluriverse of experience. And this image that I put here is actually um, an image, uh, it's a, um, it's, it says, uh, you know, in English, it, it reads, when a woman rises, no man is left behind. And it's um, from the Zapat, particular women, indigenous women in, in Chiapas, it's a Zapatista framing about um, this concept of, an, of the indigenous matriarchy. And um, if any of you are sort of interested, just a, a tiny detail, there's actually an organization called Weaving for Justice that at this point you can purchase blouses, items, things like this, this small weaving from them. And the funds are going to help women in Chiapas weavers who are dealing with the um, sort of the economic effects of COVID-19 in the region. Okay, so this is my family. Um, actually, this is probably an eighth of my family. <laughs> my family is huge. I counted one time, I think something like 200 cousins, you know, uh, that's what it is to belong to a tribe, essentially. <laughs> and, um, and my I am very fortunate to have been raised in um, a family that is very much led by women. There's a lot of women in the family. I have um, uh, seven uh, aunties, tias, I have, um, and, and, the, and our, I won't go too much into our particular traditions as a people, but um, there is sort of, it, I would say, uh, a kind of a gender balance in terms of the way um, labor is distributed and in terms of ceremonial processes, women are revered, you know, um, and though certainly we have gone through colonial uh, processes that have contributed to sexism and maltreatment of women, I won't deny that. I was very much raised um, in the spiritual traditions of, of my people, Pascuayaki people, of the Yaqui people broadly. We are a binational tribe, so we have an autonomous zone in Sonora, Mexico, and we have a federally recognized reservation just outside of Tucson, and we also have um, barrios and neighborhoods um, that are places where our folks live in the Phoenix area. So Guadalupe is probably the one you're most familiar with, but we also have one in Scottsdale, um, Ben Hummel, Escatel, Coolidge, Florence, Eloy, sort of all over um, the state. So I'm sharing with you this particular image, which is of, because uh, the day is coming up, Anima Mikuam, it's our um, day of the dead. Um, and that's every year my family gets together and we make all the food for people, our ancestors who've passed on. We have a book, every Yaqui family has a book called, uh, it's kind of like a book of the dead. And we keep our ancestors' names in that book. And um, our holy people, our religious people, our prayer people come and they pray over the food. This food is nourishing our ancestors in the afterlife, in the other, in the other worlds. Um, we, be we believe in multiple interlaced worlds, aniam, and this is the food that nourishes them and they get to enjoy being with us. Um, we always use real flowers. We don't use plastic flowers and we use um, food that's wholesome, including uh, treats like alcohol and cigarettes <laughs> and, and cookies and things like that because the, 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 the aromas of the food and the flowers are for us what our ancestors eat. You know, they're not actually eating the food, ingesting it, they're eating the aromas of it. Um, I also included um, in this image, our deer dancer, uh, which is kind of a, it's, it continues to be a mystery for many of the anthropologists who, who try to sort of study us and figure us out. But uh, we have sort of a pre-colonial um, religion that has incorporated elements of Catholicism and Christianity into it. But if you are able to sort of, it's kind of like a palimpsest. I don't know if you are familiar with this concept, but if you look through the Catholicism and Christianity of our religion, you can see these um, sort of very pre-colonial, pre-Christian modalities 
And that is our strength as a people, are those modalities. They're very much connected to the land. They're connected to our sacred responsibility to care for our sacred river, the Rio Yaqui in Sonora, Mexico, and the entire Sonoran Desert, I might add. Um, I also included in here this image, it's a Zapatista image of um, a native woman, indigenous woman in the moon, because as if any of you are familiar with um, sort of Mesoamerican belief systems, um, the, uh, for us, it's Mala Mecha, Mother Moon, but it's sort of like the moon is a woman, Tonantzin, Virgen de Guadalupe, these are all sort of, sort of uh, emblems of the power of women. So I grew up with that. I grew up in this um, spiritual tradition, this religious practice, and our spiritual traditions, if you've ever been to any of our ceremonies, are actually open to the public at Easter time. Um, part of them are reenactments of the suffering our people have gone through. And one of the greatest traumas that our people has suffered was um, a, a massacre. See, basically, there was the Porfirio Diaz, a dictator in Mexico, um, had about a 10-year genocidal campaign, official campaign to kill Yaquis uh, from about, um, it was officially from like up until 1910 for about 10 years, but unofficially the our people had been hunted from like the late 1880s all the way up and when it became official it was just like you could put prices out you could say things like a yaki ear is worth this many pesos or a yaki child is worth this many you know um and so um when i began to learn about this i i heard the stories growing up from my tias from my aunties uh, we have colonial we have historical trauma there's no doubt about that but i did not know what that meant. I just knew that I heard stories about um, how we were persecuted and how 29 families were sent north into the state of Arizona. The, the U.S.-Mexico border was still being sort of negotiated at that point. Um, it, it, the, it had been established, but it was kind of a bit movable. Um, anyways, uh, 29 families were sent north to sort of retain the traditions and spiritual practices of the people because um, there was a strong belief among many Yaquis in Sonora that if we did not sort of send a satellite, you know, of Yaquis to the furthest northern hunting grounds of our people, then um, we might, you know, perish. We would go extinct as a people. So um, when I was probably in my, um, I guess, in my 20s, I started to look into the colonial histories. I uh, had to learn to speak Spanish a little bit better. I had to learn to, to decipher Castilian, sometimes French. Um, I had to um, take time to listen to the elders. And I also started reading decolonial theory. And when I realized that Yaqui women in particular were persecuted because of being women, you know, because they were the progenitors of the people, they were the ones that were teaching the cultural traditions and the language, I, I began to understand why uh, women of our tribe have this reputation for being very ferocious and fierce. And for me, when I read decolonial thinkers like Franz Fanon and so forth, who argues that truth is what hastens the departure of the colonial regime, that just to me resonates deeply. It makes um, perfect sense. So um, in, in short, for me, um, I strongly believe that when you are an indigenous person who belongs to a tribe, you have a responsibility for your people's liberation. So my family is here every year we do this, you know, part, and, and for us, liberation isn't always, um, you know, being on the front lines and engaging in direct action. Uh, liberation is every day. It's, it's small ways to sort of get out of a, a bind, a colonial bind, and to push against the colonial war of forgetting you know, and so every year we do this as a family and it's a very peaceful event, but um, I, I did grow up definitely understanding that what we were doing was sort of something we had to keep secret and private and that we could still be potentially persecuted at any time for our religious beliefs and our political existence. So, um, but nevertheless, we, you know, uh, share as a family this strong solidarity with indigenous peoples you know, not just American Indians, but around the world. And so here I am with my cousin and my godson with a sign, you know, it says, still, still, still here, indigenous rising. And it has a, you know, a feather spray painted. I did not make this sign actually. Um, 
there is another um, matriarch in the Phoenix area. She's White Mountain Apache, and she made this sign for the Tucson Women's March that we went to, that was probably in, oh gosh, when was that now? 2012, I want to say, maybe, no, it would have been 2015 or 20, I cannot, I can't even remember now. <laughs> Just so many the years of the protest, right? But she made that sign, and I ended up um, taking care of it. And we sort of pass it around when we go to different protests with other Indigenous women from different tribes who experience um, come from a similar experience. So when you know coming from this particular vantage point, which clearly is um, marginalized, socially and politically marginalized. When I was growing up, I began to experience different kinds of, I don't know how to put it, but sort of illnesses. And these are related to, it took me a while to figure it out, but related to historical trauma. Um, I suffer anxiety a little bit more than a lot of people. Um, and that has to do with the fight or flight mechanism that I inherited from growing up of, you know, with stories of, of being hunted you know, and techniques for how to escape being hunted in the deserts and being disappeared. Um, I grew up around a lot of, um, um, unfortunately in my, you know, um, amongst my social group, as well as like within the tribe, awareness of addiction, you know, and how that can really derail a person. Um, and it took me a while to, to understand the deeper emotional dynamics of that. I also grew up with a lot of traditional ways of healing. So we have our Hitevis who are traditional healers and I, I try to make appointments with them fairly, you know, um, consistently um, to get those particular kind of prayers um, for healing. Now, this does not mean that I am anti-Western medicine. My father is actually a physician. He's an extremely talented physician. He practices women's health and does cancer care. I am a scientist, you know, but when I sort of experience this range of illnesses, um, seeing ghosts, having traumatic dreams, um, physical ailments, stomach problems, migraines, um, experiencing shock at unusual times, I began to realize that you can, you know, Western medicine can give you sort of these medications that can even you out chemically. But as a native woman, as a Yaki woman, I had to do a deep dive and understand um, why I was getting sick emotionally. You know, what was my emotional health? What was my, my relational belonging to others that was shaping that emotional health? Why was I being drawn to certain kinds of uh, scenarios that were unhealthy? And through that process, I began to realize that um, spirituality was actually the force that was driving my intellectual endeavors and was also driving the bond that I was creating over the years with native and indigenous women from other tribes who were experiencing, who were suffering similarly. So I include this image in here. This is um, a mother and she is singing a prayer song. She's a water protector. This is an image from Standing Rock. And for those of you who are not familiar what happened with the No Dapple protests, I won't go into it too deeply, only in so far as to say that this was the largest gathering in indigenous North America of native peoples for a very long time. And it was prophesied by the seven council fires of the Lakota, Nakota, and Dakota people. And the amount of Native and Indigenous people who showed up for this event, either physically, spiritually, you know, from wherever they are, were providing resources and everything was galvanizing. But it's, it was very much strongly shaped by Indigenous women and Indigenous matriarchs who were aiming for a liberation of their peoples and who had been through traumas and had recent memories of it much like what I explained to you before. So when you come to, you know, from this sort of vantage point of understanding things, you know, does uh, indigeneity, you know, does one become indigenous? You know, this is a deb debate in the field by reading theory about ind indigeneity or decoloniality. And I would say, no, it's an embodied experience. It's a relational experience. It's a kinship experience. It's ancestral. It's in our language and our life ways and our belonging to the land. We're born for the land. We're no, we don't have happy birthday, okay? <laughs> Where it's like, happy birthday, it's awesome, you're you. You get, you know, this like awesome new pair of shoes and you have whatever you want and we're going to go to Chuck E. Cheese and whatever. No, for indigenous peoples, when we are born, we are born to care for the earth. And so um, for us, this annual remembrance of birthday is what can I do for the earth around me? Like it's a, a time to sort of 
reflect on how you need to live a life in harmony in spite of the kind of colonial empire which we are currently living under. So um, the sci I mentioned being a scientist. Did I mention I'm a scientist? It still sort of is astounding to me. I can't believe it. <laughs> but um, when you know, one of the, the strengths, one of the ways that I sort of learned about my own history and about this deeply spiritual and religious sort of um, way to approach decoloniality was through stories, you know, and I always wanted to be a writer in, in part time. I'm a part time poet. They still write. And but um, I really quickly learned at a young age that the stories that I was hearing were not written anywhere and would never be written anywhere. And furthermore, that they could only be shared um, orally um, and you know, that they had this like transformative power for among the listeners and, and that they were shared among families, you know, tribal families across reservations, across tribes. And so um, when I went to get my PhD, I started out as a librarian because I was fascinated with the idea of libraries as being a places to um, transmit these stories, to create spaces for not only tribal peoples, but marginalized peoples to sort of convene. You know, you don't have to be rich to go to a public library, you know, and to find a home and to, and to find something that reflects who you are there. Um, but I really quickly realized that I, I sort of, you know, the problems were bigger than what I could handle as a public librarian or as a university librarian. I, I did both before I became a professor. When I was in graduate school, my doctoral program at, I went to the University of Washington Information School in Seattle. I uh, did quite a bit of reading and, and realized that people thought, think of, and they still do think of sovereign native nations in the US as failed states. There is still this narrative that the US has settled the wild west and tribes are just sort of these like, I mean, it's, it's codified into law, domestic dependent nations, that we have no inherent sovereignty, that we're just Americans that need to sort of assimilate more, that we're ethnic minorities, that we are backward people, anti-technological, all this kind of stuff. Um, and I, re you know, I started reading about this and I started reading about other countries that had likewise been termed failed states by colonial powers. And I realized that the countries that overcome this, that um, strive toward a kind of development that has a liberatory capacity for their peoples, invest heavily in infrastructure. So I started studying infrastructure. In particular, I was interested in internet infrastructure because this was the way that I, at that time, thought that Native and Indigenous people could transmit key strategies toward political mobilization, toward organizing under the rubric of sovereignty, and not, and not only that, but sharing oral histories, you know, uh, language lessons, um, connecting with relatives they hadn't seen in a really long time. So I ended up writing a book about how tribes command um, their own internet infrastructure because they have their own reservation lands, land-based tribes, and some landless tribes actually are able to um, acquire significant amounts of capital to sort of build out their own internet infrastructure where all the major telecom monopolies refuse to go. And when they build out that infrastructure, they are able to go back to the federal government because sovereign native nations do not have relationships with states. They negotiate directly with the federal government. That's, the, that's a, the, by definition um, what sovereignty is. So they um, negotiate directly with the federal government. In so doing, they can speak back to the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, NTIA, National, oh geez, now that I'm talking, I'm gonna forget it. National Telecommunications Information Administration. They can speak back to federal authorities and say, this is how we need our internet to be. This is how we need to regulate it so that we provide affordable, robust connectivity and access toward our people, you know. Um, and so, and what ends up happening is that uh, Congress and also um, the federal government, all, all that has to do with building out internet, all the different branches and, and agencies and whatever, end up making sort of um, rules and priorities and policies that strengthen tribal sovereignty, that acknowledge it, that recognize it, and then strengthen it. So this is in the book, I, I, I say, look, the process of network design and deployment embeds these infrastructures within the ongoing negotiation of the sovereign rights of tribes in the US. So tribes who command their own internet infrastructure, I argue in the book, also increase the capacity for their people to exercise sovereignty through the internet. So while I was doing this work, let's see, now I've lost, here we go. While I, was at, while I was doing this work, clearly one of the things on my mind 
was social media, how Native peoples use social media towards political mobilization. Because while I was writing this book, um, or it was it was the tail end of my dissertation work. Idle No More was in full bloom up in um, sort of the can, you know Canada First Nations and also the um, the border with U.S. and Canada. And at the same time, so were the Zapatistas in uh, marching through Mexico City, you know, arguing for indigenous rights. It was 2012, and I began to um, realize, you know, there had been this sort of colonial narrative before that native indigenous peoples don't use they don't use smartphones they don't use computing they don't use devices because they're like backward people it's not according to their culture whatever so there's like this racism about that right um however um i don't know more was a strong indication of the pervasiveness of digital devices throughout indian country and also throughout first nations in canada as was the the march in 2012 um, in Mexico City of the Zapatistas, because all of that was not being talked about through mass media. You know, mass media sort of always picks up our stories, you know, sometimes months after they happen. Um, it was all of these things, all of these movements were being organized by people purely through uh, short uh, SMS, you know, short messaging, basically instant messaging on phones. It was being organized through social media. It was being organized through websites and um, things like that. And um, Native peoples were so connected with each other, in particular for Idle No More, that what would happen was that somebody would get a text message on their phone saying, be at this border crossing uh, at 4 p.m., bring your drum. And that, that's all it would say. And you'd have like 50, 100, you know, tribal people showing up from various nations, you know, with their smudge, you know, with their smudge, with their drums, with their, their um, prayer flags, feathers, whatever who were standing in solidarity against Prime Minister, Canadian Prime Minister Harper because he was um, in introducing a series of acts that was eroding First Nations sovereignty and introducing oil pipelines. So I began to do a number of social media studies, um, rather that is studies of Native Indigenous uses of social media and found that Indigenous people's digital tactics are shaped by the kinds of resistance essential to their endurance within their geopolitical locations. And so what that means is that there are nevertheless places where there's not good internet access or connectivity, or there is um, corporate surveillance, private security surveillance, government surveillance. And so they um, are keenly aware of that and will use, um, create what is called, what are called digital repertoires of contention that are fitted to their place and fitted to the needs of their movements. Um, continuing that work, I began to learn more about this concept of epistemic injustice. And we saw this mostly, um, most, how shall I put it? Um, it was on full display at, um, at No Dapple, at Standing Rock, in the sense that um, there was sort of like an, a, a designed attempt to sort of depict water protectors and the Standing Rock Sioux Nation and all the nations who participated in the era, but in the area, but particular Standing Rock Sioux Nation as sort of these wanton savages, as dangerous, you know, as just sort of, um, you know, as terrorists, as eco-terrorists. Um, but if you go back and, and really examine this thing from an informatic perspective, you can see all sorts of instances where various layers of crimes and wrongdoing have been committed against Native and Indigenous peoples in the area and sanctioned, you know, sanctioned by the Morton County um, Sheriff's Department, sanctioned by private security, sanctioned by state authorities, by the feds. Um, one of my favorite tools to look at is called Muckrock. And Muckrock is a place where you can see um, what journalists have, uh, uh, have applied for FOIAs, Freedom of Information Act requests, on all sorts of things. And if you um, do a search for DAPL on there, you can see, you know, how many, um, there's many examples of you know, sort of the FBI agreeing to share information about sort of counterintelligence with Morton County. And just, it's just this, it's an, it's an actual attempt to sort of, you know, misinform, disinform, deceive, discredit the people who are standing up for their rights. So as I'm doing all this work over the years, I started to notice this phenomena. And I don't know if it's partially that I just really like hanging around with other, you know, very smart women, or <laughs> I just, you know, there was like a predominance of Native and Indigenous women who from their various practice, their various sort of, you know, domain knowledge were engaging in digital tactics 
in various places for the purpose of creating a better world for indigenous peoples and especially for indigenous women and girls. And um, I, it was so um, natural to me that I would find native and indigenous women engaging in technology work that um, I was sort of, you know, I, it didn't occur to me until very recently that I needed to write about it, that, that that's not the norm in, in the broader, you know, industry, the broader tech industry. And it is also not the norm in the broader tech industry for, um, for many people at all to be engaging in liberation work, to be working against, you know, political oppression and, and decolonization. They may, they may talk about decolonization, you know, in theory, but um, they're not actually willing to go so far as to file lawsuits, to go to court, to engage in direct action, to do intense um, time in ceremony and prayer or to change their life ways. So what I ended up sort of realizing was that, okay, if there's all these native and indigenous women doing this like stunning work around um, how information, how flows of information can be used to liberate you know, our peoples and to strengthen our tribes at, in various ways, what is the connection amongst all of them? And so for the past number of years, what I've been doing is sort of trying to create this networked awareness of how that is, right? So what I'll do is I, I work with computer scientists and net, network administrators to sort of boost the internet network backbones that are um, close to tribes or, or around tribes. And then um, sort of we can look at how people use the internet in those communities and match, create novel technologies that match the kinds of sort of bandwidth that they need, you know, native and indigenous peoples need to, to, to be engaged, however that is, and then sort of advance technologies that meet them there. Because there's all sorts, when you're deploying physical infrastructures, there's all sorts of like um, challenges that you have to think about, you know, trenching, fiber cable, fiber, you know, are we going to put aerial cable? Or are we going to dig? You know, is this a climate for it? Is it even going to work in there? Do we have spectrum rights? So, so anyways, I do a combination of social media studies that strengthen awareness of how Native Indigenous peoples share information and knowledge toward liberation. I combine that with advancement of network backbones in Indian country. And I also do um, different kinds of analysis of concepts relating to Indigenous knowledge, traditional um, cultural expressions, Indigenous data, all this kind of stuff to sort of show people the, also the fine-tuned nature of the content that's flowing through these physical infrastructures. And of course, mentorship, mentorship all the way, because we need more people to be doing this work. So very recent, of course, I'm still doing protests through all of this, right? <laughs> and belong to these like indigenous matriarch talking circles and all this kind of stuff. But one of the things that I've been sort of engaging in more recently is coming up with specific methodologies for social network analysis from the perspective of being an indigenous feminist who is um, cognizant that uh, we need to sort of um, put de embed decolonial theory into our methodological interpretations, you know, of results of findings. We need to sort of speak back to the greater computer human interaction communities, the fields of computer science and publish in those spaces about um, decolonial um, practices and methodologies about indigenous feminist methodologies. And we also need to correct the record, the scholarly record. There's just, we, um, I did a study with uh, two others, um, three others, gosh, uh, about a year, it was, we were tracking sort of the rise of 108 Native American women um, political candidates in the 2018 midterm elections. It was astounding, right? All these women, all of a sudden, Native women are running for office at various levels of government. And we did a Twitter study of that, everything that was being tweeted about them and everything they were tweeting out. And we ended up finding evidence of voter suppression through the body of those tweets, through the content of those tweets. But if I had been doing that study with anybody but Native and Indigenous women, I don't think that our team would have caught that because that knowledge was not in the media. That's just knowledge, it's tacit knowledge. It's stuff that we you know, talk about on the phone, like, oh, did you hear what happened to my cousin in North Dakota? You know, or did you hear what happened to my cousin in Kansas, you know, and, and that's how we share information. So that is the enlivened network that sort of reifies these um, technical infrastructures, the technical networks that I study. So I argue ultimately that indigenous feminist approach to digital methods is not simply about applying computational methods, etc. 
rather it's about developing the human networks of kin that enliven technicized practices toward autonomy and sovereignty. And that in so doing divest the authority of settler patriarchy over indigenous airwaves, airspace, knowledge institutions, and media networks. And the process is the purpose. Um, this particular image, I believe, is this of Idle No More? I think this, I think this might be, I, no, no, this is in regard to missing and murdered indigenous women. They're wearing red. Yeah. So, okay, so what's the secret sauce to all this is um, fundamentally this concept of relationality. And, you know, when we, when I start doing this work or when I connect with other Native and Indigenous women, we don't get together and, and say like, hey, let's build a network together. You do this, you build this. And, you know, you've got like your Slack channel going <laughs> and like these plans to publish scientific papers or whatever. We really um, commune and we commune across the very levels that I indicated at the beginning of this talk, the levels of our common suffering and the levels of our common purpose. So we go through various kinds of ceremony together all the time, um, whether it's emotional connection, whether it's a spiritual connection, it's a bond over something, um, a story, it's cooking together, it's raising our children together, you know, um, it's caring for the land together, it's um, engaging in reciprocity. And what happens when you sort of realize that you have this emotional body, spiritual body, you know, a historical body that's motivating your present, you begin to heal across all of those levels of your being. And that is the essence of the truth value of relationality. So what I'm saying is that you can't just build a network and people will liberate themselves through the internet, you know? Um, people have to bond at varying levels of their being to achieve decolonial existence. And so this is why I argue that, you know, indigenous approaches to internet infrastructure and digital methods differ because we're not trying to sort of, you know, datafy or digitize our life. We're not breaking it down into these tiny component parts, you know, um, instead we're trying to embrace a holism, you know, and this, this is why we also have conversations about what we don't talk about online, you know, sacred knowledges, private knowledges and self-determination away from the internet because we know that that's our endurance, that's our survivance. And because we also know that as people who are frequently exploited, any information that we put online, any knowledge that we put online ends up being appropriated, right? And resold by urban outfitters. <laughs> I mean, you name it, you know? So we're also extremely protective, but it is with purpose. It's because we have sacred instructions for how to do that. And once you have those sacred instructions and you combine them with this sort of um, relational approach, relational belonging, essentially you're building kinship networks. And through those kinship networks, you sort of develop what um, uh, Leanne Simpson, Anishinaabe writer Leanne Simpson calls a constellated intelligence. So this is kind of like walking into a room with someone, you look at the room together and you're seeing the same thing. You're seeing that this is the guy that's gonna squash your idea. This is the one that's gonna, going to sell you all out. This is the one that's going to go running home to their professor and like, you know, sort of, you know, or, or they're going to be the snitch, so to speak. This is the one that's in it for purely selfish purposes. And these are the three that are going to, that are solid, that are going to help you. That is subversive lucidity. That's not a term that I coined. Jose Medina, um, a philosopher at Vanderbilt University, coined this idea of subversive lucidity which he said is made of a combination of open-mindedness, diligence, and humility, and a keen awareness of one's uh, oppressed existence and how to overcome it through strategic social positioning and orchestration of relationships for meaningful complex communication. Maria Lugones, um, Chicana feminist Maria Lugones actually was the one who identified this framing of complex communication and she passed away not too long ago. I believe there's a memorial um, publication coming out for her through Malks. Um, but in any case, this is what Native and Indigenous feminists are aiming for, the subversive lucidity, seeing, the, seeing colonial, colonization happening before it happens, seeing oppression unfold before it's full blown, and being able to sort of uh, diffuse it or, or um, alleviate it or push back or, or be prepared. So ultimately, um, I, you know, I do... I am, there's various schools of thought around um, how Native and Indigenous women sort of cleave to their visions of the matriarch. And um, these can be through embracing very traditional ways, very traditional tri um, tribal ways, 
These can be through sort of stepping away actually from uh, traditional gender roles and embracing a very sort of like American mainstream existence and working that way. And they can also be sort of this um, kind of like, I call it like it's, it's, it's inspired by Grace Dillon and Beth and say, but this indigenous futuristic thing, like, yes, we've gone through this in the past, but the earth has, has now changed. It's been terraformed. And what is gonna be our responsibilities moving towards the future? And I think that um, science, technology, and society studies, indigenous science, technology, societies are extremely integral to this passage into a new kind of way of being for indigenous peoples, because it is through that lens that we can, um, we can have those discuss discussions about how the earth has been terraformed, about how our homelands are not what they once were, about how we're all speaking English and Spanish now and not our, our traditional languages, you know, and how we're thinking now. So in any case, even within that, you know, it's possible to st sustain um, a spiritual relationality, kinship, networks of belonging that carry us through, you know, sort of like a spacecraft into the future, you know, so that we are not going to sort of assimilate. We're not even really going to acculturate. We're just sort of picking up tools and bringing them into our cosmovisions, into our ways of life. So that actually is my last slide. <laughs> I think I did pretty good on time and that there is time for questions and conversations. So I go ahead and stop uh, screen sharing. Thank you so much. That was wonderful it was very informative and and just um fascinating to listen to um where uh, if you if marissa if you would like to take a few moments to i don't know catch your breath get some water um we're um open now to questions uh from our audience um if you could use the question and answer tab at the bottom of your screen and send us questions um and as i mentioned if you're interested in um verbalizing your question live um, put that in parentheses ask live and i um, can unmute you so you can do so um, or if you would prefer for me to read out your question that's fine as well just leave the ask live portion out um, as we wait for some of these questions i i realized as you were speaking um, just now towards the end this uh the the subversive lucidity uh reference actually reminded me a bit about um, this concept that Ursula or Dr. Orr was speaking about last week. Um, I think she called it, um, oh, I can't think of it now, but, um, um, oh, I'll, I'll think of it, but it was talking about the way that Black folks um, sp particularly sort of African Americans in the US um, read and engage with the state and it was um, and so and she was pushing back against this notion that folks were being pessimistic or whatever right what she was saying was because we've learned how to read the cues yes. um, in a particular way based on our historical traumas and um, it's it, it's very reminiscent to sort of as you were describing that like when we walk into a room how we read you know that that resonated a lot with that with that statement that um or that concept that dr Orr was discussing um okay so um we have a question um are you ready yes i'm ready <laughs> okay <lovely. laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, we have a question from um, Dr. Gan, who's a faculty in our in our department. She says, "I am teaching um, Introduction to Global Health in the spring of uh, I imagine she means 2021. It says 2020, right. and would like to be very intentional about incorporating Indigenous perspectives throughout the course. Um, do you have recommendations about how to incorporate such perspectives into global the into study global health?" Yeah, I mean, so so indigenous perspective, it's like, okay, like these are vast, right? <laughs> like global, what part of the globe? So, but I think that um, there, you know, definitely I would look at, so I, we did a, my research team and I did a study not too long ago. It was a, um, uh, gosh, what is it called? I'm spacing now, a citation analysis. And we looked at how indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge and uh, uh, traditional ecological knowledge are sort of, you know, what fields are they associated with in the published literature? And there is a lot um, in um, medicine and in clinical practice that 
pertains to indigenous knowledge and TKE and um, TK. So that's one possibility is to, you know, that's, so that's the, the part of me that's still a librarian, which is saying, okay, let's go into web of science and like do our Boolean operator, right? Like connect, you know, indigenous health and, and um, indigenous knowledge and global health and see what we come up with, you know? But I think that um, one of, there's a few things that come to mind. And one of those has to do with food sovereignty, the food sovereignty movement. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I, I, I really appreciate the work of Michael, a Ricora scholar, Michael Yellowbird, on um, decolonizing sort of um, decolonizing health. And um, I appreciate that work because a lot of the stuff that is about, you know, indigenous knowledge and health, you know, or TKE and health is about, you know, oh, these, uh, these primitive people have, uh, they use this leaf to heal this skin disease and and it, then it's like this can be used in pharmaceuticals you know that's what a lot of the conversation is um, or uh, on the inverse it's um, these people these poor primitive people are suffering because they don't have basic water infrastructure or whatever so it's kind of like a um, what do we call it uh, pover uh, poverty porn mm -hmm. and it doesn't show the ways that native and indigenous peoples um, sort of achieve um, health equity through their own means. So some of the, the stuff that I really appreciate, that's why I really appreciate the food sovereignty movement, incorporating the food sovereignty movement uh, stuff, not only because there's books out about it now and there's conferences and everything, but food sovereignty is very much about understanding that the reasons we have high rates of disease, not only in Indian country, but in you know, sort of the general population in these developed, you know, in, in the US and Canada in particular, is because people are eating too much processed food, you know, and they're poisoning themselves. We have a lot of toxins and pesticides, and it's, it's clear that these, lead poisoning, all sorts of things, it's clear that these things are associated with cancers and all kinds of, of health problems. Food sovereignty is about native and indigenous peoples coming together and saying, we are going to eat clean. We're going to um, look at traditional ways of caring for waterways so that we have healthy salmon, and the salmon is what grounds us as a people and makes us spiritually strong and physically strong, you know? Uh, so it's about traditional food practices, but also about traditional medicinal practices. So I appreciate that work quite a bit. Um, um, Michael Yellowbird, again, I'm trying to remember the name of his book, but he talks about how the combination of food sovereignty and the colonial means to wellness sort of, um, help a person holistically achieve um, a health state in spite of the colonial, the physical evidence of colonial traumas that are in their, their bodies. Um, and I might add to that Maria Braveheart Yellow, it's always it Maria Yellow Horse Braveheart or Maria Braveheart Yellow Horse. I can't remember right now. Um, but she, her work on historical trauma and how it shows up in, in physical indications in the body mm -hmm. is extremely important as well. Um, for framing um, appropriate therapies for Native and Indigenous peoples. So I don't know if that um, answers the question, but there's at least three resources that might be interesting and helpful. Um, yeah, that I think, as you mentioned, the, the, that, that tends to be the space that you often hear um, a lot of, you mentioned earlier about what information um, Indigenous folks are comfortable sharing in, in online because of the ways in which it becomes appropriated. And to, to me, um, the example of the pharmaceutical, the, the, the extraction of that knowledge and building these sort of pharmaceutical whatever is, uh, is a perfect example of that, that kind of strips all of the um, context, all of the spiritual aspects, um, and sort of the deep knowledge and just kind of takes that little bit of like this chemical, this compound can be, you know what I mean? And yep. does this thing that is, um, okay. So let's see, um, we have someone who would like to ask a question live. The question itself is not on, if that's okay with you, I can, I can unmute. Sure. Okay, let's see if I can find them. don't actually see them in the, in the live 
Maybe they signed out. Uh, yeah, I can't, I can't find them when I'm looking back in the section. So perhaps they have. Yeah. Um, I see Gary McCone, McCone in there. Yay, Gary McCone. It's uh, years ago, Gary McCone and I, I had the honor of traveling together through, I want to say it was uh, Crow Agency and a few like, um, I think I want to say that we went to um, Battle of the Greasy Grass site. And that's just one of the most memorable trips. Um, Gary is also a, a tribal, somebody who's very much an advocate for tribal librarianship and library services, and Native Indigenous people. So happy to see you here, Gary. Thank you. Okay, we have an, a question from one of our graduate students, um, Aliyah Hop. She says, I recently took an introductory graduate course in STS that did not include a single reading by an Indigenous author. Can you speak more about your vision of Indigenous STS? Yes. So, um, so science and technology studies. Um, uh, yes. So the, the, the problem, I think, with science and technology studies as it is now, right, is that um, there are very few um, people of color and people from marginalized social positions who are active in the field. There are a number of people, you know, Alondra Nelson, Kim Talbert, there's just like some really important, Michelle Lee Weron, there's a bunch of really important, Michelle Murphy, there's a lot of really amazing people who are working in the space. But if you go to a 4S conference, you know, um, and what does 4S stand for? Oh, geez. Society for the Study of Science and something. <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> so anyway, if you go to one of these conferences, it's, you know, apparent that there's this sort of, a, it's like kind of a merger of um, ethnography and anthropology and technology studies. Um, and there's, there's many great sessions there. And, and there's been in, in recent years, many more feminist interventions in the space. But I cannot forget, years ago, I actually went to 4S. It wasn't that long ago. It was in Boston. So maybe it was like 2017. Um, and Kim Talbear, who wrote Native American DNA, mm -hmm. she's asked to give the keynote. And Trump had just been elected. And um, so there's worries um, in the 4S community about rollbacks for uh, studies of climate change, about how documents are missing from the EPA website, about this emphasis on um, oil infrastructure and how that's going to affect, you know, all sorts, all manner of things. And there's also concerns about um, platform capitalism, right? These social media companies that are just sort of now dominating the space and mm -hmm. how that in some ways contributed to um, his election in the first place, um, engagement of big data surveillance. So anyways, um, you know, Kim Talbear gets up. She's... Um, I, I can't, um, she's Lakota, but I can't remember the full name of her people at right while I'm, now that I'm talking to you. <laughs> she gets up and she gives this keynote and the keynote is basically like, look y'all, like this is colonization since the beginning. Like don't be ask, acting like <laughs> this has not been in the original instructions of the US, you know, since the very beginning. It has always been about terraforming. It has always been about environmental degradation. It has always been about mining, you know, about destruction of waterways and plants. Um, you know, it's, it's always been about displacement and dispossession of peoples. There's nothing new here. The only thing that's new is that now it's affecting the middle class and the upper middle class. And that is what's shocking. Mm -hmm. And so she gave this, this amazing rousing speech and ends up saying like, if we really want to understand this moment as indigenous, as, as STS people, we need to deeply understand what it means, what colonization means and what it means to decolonize, right? And she says this and all of a sudden, like this room of like, I don't know, it seemed like there was 400 people in there or more. They all got up and started like wildly clapping, right? And I'm like looking around like, do they know what they're clapping about? <laughs> like they're, do they know what like, because what Kim's talking about, what Kim Talbert is talking about, right, is this fundamental respect for the inherent sovereignty of Native nations, which means that the U.S. has to kind of like step it back with all the consumption, with all this technological innovation that displaces and dispossesses people, with this over-reliance on fossil fuels, with this um, desire for urban centers that, you know, plunder rural and remote locations, you know. And, and she's talking about a fundamental respect for understanding anti-racist work, mm 
in science and technology studies. I'm looking around the room. I was like, actually, I was like there, I know there are like, I think maybe two other people in this room right now who know what Dr. Talbert is talking about. And that is Kristen Simmons from University of Chicago and Michelle Murphy um, from University of Toronto. So, um, so my vision of indigenous STS really does understand that pollution and environmental degradation is a colonial problem. You know, it understands uh, things in geologic time. I, I really appreciate, there's a recent book that I've been reading by Catherine Yusoff called um, A Billion Black Anthropocenes. And it's about understanding how, um, you know, uh, the plunder of, of oil, of minerals and so forth is very much related to um, the trauma that black folks experience to this, to the present, you know, and I'm reading that as an indigenous author saying, well, yeah, because that's <laughs> what ours is like too. This is, you know, we were, you know, we were also forced, you know, removed, forcibly removed from these lands, which were then, you know, um, people were unjustly enslaved to, and forced to work these lands. So it's like, there's a, there's a, there's a common um, experience there. It's not, it's not the exact, exact same kind of trauma, but it's, it's a common commonality related to plunder. Mm -hmm and piracy. And so um, that is, that's what I hope for in the future with Indigenous STS. And I should mention that there are, and I am part of networks of Indigenous STS, feminist, Indigenous, fe feminist and queer Indigenous STS thinkers. And all we do every year is mentor each other and mentor juniors and try to bring them up in the ranks. Because this, we really do perceive that this is sort of, um, you know, at least in the U.S. and Canada and New Zealand, Aotearoa, you know, in Mexico, um, yeah, that that we have to uh, speak back to phenomena like algorithmic discrimination, you know, fossil fuel infrastructure, um, pipelines and dams, from this that those particular positions. So that I don't know if that answers your question. I hope it does. <laughs> Wonderful. Okay. Um, so shifting a little bit, um, we have another question by um, Megan Webb and um, they ask, thank you for the wonderful talk. Well, they say thank you for the wonderful talk and great book. Can you speak a bit more to how social media creates a space for Indigenous women to assert their agency and build and expand Indigenous um, activist and kinship matriarchies? Sure. So there's, I actually just wrote a chapter on this and gave uh, a talk about this um, last week. So, so very specifically, um, you know, before social media was what it was is now. You know, like everybody's on, you know, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, whatever. It's sort of this, like it's this massively popular. Um, Native and Indigenous peoples. There are some Native and Indigenous sort of technologists who are creating their sort of private video sharing channels, kind of like a Native YouTube, just for their reservations or just for their peoples. And they were also sort of creating like intranets for sharing knowledge, digitizing and sharing um, archival photos and old songs and that kind of stuff just among tribal peoples. So, um, so I would say that that was, that's an important beginning, you know, and that was happening in like the late nineties and the early two thousands. Um, when social media began to take off, I began to wonder, when am I going to see my cousins on there, right? So this is my space. That's my age, okay? So this is my space. And I remember seeing like Yaki kids on my space talking about the next elections for tribal council, talking, just, just, just communing in that space and just being really excited that they were using that space, sharing music, you know, designing it, putting in Yaki images and so forth. And at that point, um, among other sort of native indigenous technologists, it was this question of, well, when are they going to start using it for language, language, social media for language learning? And that has sort of what's been taken off in, um, in uh, indigenous language revitalization movements is sort of these private groups through Facebook or through YouTube or, or whatever, where people can share um, snippets of their language or brief language lessons, um, oral histories, ancient prophecies, sacred dances um, to sort of you know, share that knowledge amongst each other, especially for those who are in diaspora who have have to be away from their people for whatever reason. And so, um, so, but that, those kind of like, so it's kind of strange. I mean, the way I would describe it would actually gave a talk about this years ago, but it's sort of like there's these, at the time there were the, these little tiny enclaves of native peoples, you know, across various platforms. And then the platforms began to merge. I mean, then they became platforms. It used to be a social media site, then they became platforms, right? 
And it was like your Google is hooked up to your YouTube, which is hooked up to your Facebook. And you, if there's this cross platform interoperability. And so that's what we've got going on right now, right? So like there's a bunch of Instagram sites that are for indigenous matriarchs, like indigenous goddess gang, you know, um, there is um, a center for um, uh, indigenous birthing in New Mexico that promotes a lot of very positive messages through their Instagram account, you know, and these things go, um, my, my friend and colleague Jacqueline Russell does Grown Up Navajo, which is sort of um, Navajo women's approaches to being a mom, being a professional, you know, you know, being, being a good relative. This, you see lots of sites like these and, and you tend to, as you know, um, develop these networks, you know, of people who are using the same sites and sharing similar messages. Red Nation, and uh, they're out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, but Red Nation is sort of this um, indigenous Marxist, um, I should say American Indian Marxist um, location for organizing, and it's very much informed by uh, visions of indigenous matriarchy and particular histories of Marxism through Navajo Nation. Um, and they frequently uh, are protesting and marching against things that are harmful to Native and Indigenous women. So, um, but those, that kind of cross-platform sharing is extremely important. And it also, I mean, I, I, I'm not just saying that sort of like metaphorically, you know, I've actually mapped them out. Some of them <laughs> sort of looked at it, you know, yeah. using social network analysis. And there is no doubt in my mind that the landslide winnings of Sharice Davis and Deb Holland, you know, a, a number of Native American women political candidates in 2018, was absolutely tied to Native and Indigenous enclave, I should say, enclaves of Native and Indigenous issue groups that were sending messages across platforms to each other, tweeting, you know, sort of campaigning informally for um, particular issues to be raised. So for example, missing and murdered indigenous women, anti-environmental degradation, feminist representation in Congress and, and those sorts of things. So that's kind of just, I mean, that's, that's a super, super quick answer <laughs> to that question, you know, and that's, that's just what's, you know, fairly publicly visible. That doesn't take into account the private messages that native and indigenous women share with each other. There is in the US, I know because I'm a part, sort of like a Native Women's Whisper Network, where we sort of um, touch base with each other through phone and through social media frequently to raise awareness of predators um, operating through reservations, um, sexual predators, people who are um, pretending to be Native so that they can get the benefits from greater society at large. Um, that's where um, there's a lot of info transmitted about missing and murdered Indigenous women, people who've gone missing you know, keep an, keep an eye out for um, Native folks and um, news and updates. And that, that actually, it's a very potent network of powerful Native women who just regularly sort of always in contact, you know, and, and doing what they can from where they're at to protect sovereignty or to protect Indigenous dignity. So I hope that answers your question. Um, I hope to have a chapter coming out about that pretty soon. But um, yeah, we'll get, that'll, that'll be in the future. <laughs> um, we have another question that I will ask, but I actually have kind of a, a, a piggyback on the question that you would just answer myself that I would like to ask. And that's, um, so, so sort of going back to what you said earlier about some of the concerns, again, I've already brought this up. Clearly, this is something that's at the, on the forefront of my mind. The, um, security, I guess, so privacy issue, right? And and what happens, um, you know, I, I think, you know, I grew up, I'm probably right at that sort of straddling era where um, I remember sort of the before the internet was a thing thing and then, you know, it became yeah. kind of ubiquitous. And so one of the early things that I learned was whatever you put online is like out there forever, right? And it, it's, there's really no way of sort of harnessing it once it's out there. And my question is then um, going back to what you mentioned, some of the the things that, I mean, I guess there's an expectation that, you know, um, folks within the community know what to and not share. But if it is uh, working in the ways that you just mentioned, where people are using it to teach language or even sacred um, ceremonies and dances, et cetera, um, what, sort of what are the dangers then of 
when that becomes visible or trackable by the various agencies that are tracking these, you know what I mean? Um, talk a little bit, if you could, about yeah, sort of that tension. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. A, st a study just came out, actually, well, it's been a couple years. I think it was published in 2017 by researchers in, in Canada who showed an association between missing and murdered indigenous women and girls and cyber stalking online. So um, there is evidence that social media is the space through which, you know, women and girls can be groomed or, be, you know, you know, uh, beguiled into sort of the um, predatory relationships, stalking, um, abuse, bullying. Um, yeah. And so th I, I believe that they're the findings of that study made it into what does CDAW stand for right now? Committee on the gosh, it's a it's a rights group through the UN Committee on the Elimination of Something Against Women. I can't remember what the D stands for right now, but it made into it made it into an international study, essentially warning that social media is a place that leads to violence against women and girls and vulnerable peoples generally. Yeah. So yes, that is a huge problem, right? And that goes back to this, this concept that I was sharing before, which is that relationality cannot only happen online for native indigenous peoples, for anybody, you know, but you know, in these particular contexts, because these are a typically exploited people, because our knowledge is typically appropriated and, and used and misused and um, misapplied, you know, um, this is precisely why we must establish face-to-face -face connections first, kinship networks. And for any of you who are belong to Indian country, you know what this is like, sort of, it's like you come go to an event and you see another native person there and you go up and you say hello and there's like, you know, where are you from? Oh, I'm from so-and-so. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, my, uh, my uncle went there one time. Oh my God, my uncle and my, and your aunt, like they know each other. Oh my gosh, like it goes really deep. You know, like when I first came back here to work at ASU, I, um, got to meet, I met with Jacob Moore, who's our um, university's tribal liaison, essentially. Mm -hmm. And it turned out that his, his father remembered my father, <laughs> like from the years before I was born, you know? And I mean, that's, it goes really far, it goes really deep. And those kinship networks are the ones that sort of um, create spaces of safety and, and create the means for um, a digital solidarity. So yeah, um, there's other very specific surveillance that has happened to Native and Indigenous peoples. I, you know, um, uh, Pueblo Action Alliance, which is a group out of New Mexico, recently released. I, I think they're, I'm so thankful that they did this, but basically a warning to all act Indigenous activists: like, be aware of your social media traces. It can be used against you. You know, if you're going to post um, things like people taking down statues, colonial statues, and whatever, like blur of faces, or you know, um, just reminding people that the state is always watching. Mm -hmm. This was definitely a problem at during the no dapple protests mm -hmm. you know people were taking um some people were taking pictures with their phones of actions that they were engaging in that could later be used against them you know um on the other hand you also had people who were taking pictures with their phones or video that was, could be used to sort of show the brutality of law enforcement and you know and those were admissible in court in some circumstances so um yeah i don't want to paint this rosy picture that like you know um, clearly, Native and Indigenous people are still um, going to be victimized by algorithmic discrimination. Um, there's no doubt in my mind about that. You know, in the in um, two spirit gay and two spirit queer community in Indian country, Facebook for some time there was taking down people's profiles because they thought they were fake because they didn't believe those names could be real. You know, they didn't believe that person could be real, and that's just sort of has to do with stereotyping of what a native name should be or should not be you know so yeah so that's i don't know if that answers your yeah, question yeah 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 mm -hmm. okay okay so yeah. let me get back uh oh all right so <laughs> the second oops, i i think you can see it so the first question has been addressed the person who asked said based on what we just asked but they have a second question how do you hope indigenous networks will evolve adapt and grow in the future <laughs> oh, that's, that's Nikki. Nikki, Nikki could give this talk. <laughs> and right now she's like, no, <laughs> no, Dr. Duarte. Yes, you could. So how do you hope Indigenous networks will evolve, adapt, grow in the future? 
okay, well, it depends on what kind of network, right? So in terms of technological infrastructure, I really hope that they will grow because we obviously desperately need better internet access and connectivity in Indian country right now. Like COVID-19 has really shown us that we don't have enough internet connection, enough people connected to be able to sustain basic things like public schooling, you know, holding, you know, keeping up with meetings for work, you know, telecommuting, posting their art for, you know, for sale during the art, the native art markets. I mean, it's for health. It's just, it's devastating. It's a real problem. I am hoping that the Digital Reservations Act recently introduced by Deb Holland is going to um, build out, allow tribes to build out more infrastructure that's suited for their particular um, physical and political locations. In terms of issue groups through social media and so forth, um, I recently, Kim Talbert posted something on, on Facebook about how she's really concerned that the word indigenous is being sort of um, misapplied to indicate anybody of origin and not particular, I mean, global indigenous solidarity is not about that. Global indigenous solidarity, indigenous people's movements are about people who um, belong to the land. They, they liberate for the care of the earth you know, and understand that deeply relational belonging to a landscape, a homeland, you know, typically non-Western, typically non-Christian, you know, pre-colonial um, origin. So I, I strongly think that um, we are going to see the rise of more networks that call themselves Indigenous, rather more issue groups online that call themselves Indigenous because of the benefits of being able to appeal before the Organization of American States or before the UN, these sort of supranational organizations, but that are not in fact um, tending to that land. It's just an, another way of, it's another form of nationalism. Yeah. So I, that's one thing that I, I strongly see happening. I also think that we're gonna see issue groups arising that are differentiated based on class and colorism. Um, uh, Meredith Clark already showed that work sort of in Black Twitter, her analysis of Black Twitter, that you have these different sort of issue groups that are about, well, are you from Detroit? Are you from Chicago? You know, are you West Coast or are you from the Bronx? You know, are you, are you Greek life or, you know, and that in some ways can impede, it, it creates belonging, very specific identity groups, but it can also can impede solidarity across things like class, across things like color, across things like region, you know, um, and I think that that's what we're going to see in Indian country as well and in global indigenous networks is that we are going to see the rise of um, white performing white passing natives who are going to take positions of power um, based on strong sovereignty stances and that may undercut um, the voices of say our indigenous relatives who are in border detention centers right now, mm -hmm. you know, people in Chiapas, people in Central America you know um yeah so that's that's kind of what i see happening but i don't know like i said nikki you could give this talk i don't know i don't know what you think <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i this is just an aside but the, as you were talking now this this uh it, it made me think of sort of this wave it appears to me but i'm sure it's been happening for a while of um sort of passing that's been coming out of folks appropriating other identities and and um sort sort of using them in very interesting ways uh i say interesting because i th interesting is my placeholder for <laughs> you know when i don't have any other descriptive they're very um, violent it is quite in incredibly it's, violent and yeah. and um yeah, it's just, it's, it's, the phenomenon is, I compare it to what we talk about often as women of color um, in academia, sort of as a contrast or foil to imposter syndrome, right? <laughs> Where yeah. um, if, even in our own sort of lived identities, we often feel like imposters in these spaces, and yet there are actual imposters <laughs> very comfortably living sort of, uh, sort of taking on our skin and living in them. And it's very, it's a, it's a disturbing visual and just a, to think about, but that just kind of made me think of that. Yeah. Um, I think that's always going to be around, sadly. I think that's, yeah. Um, I, 
I have, I don't think we have another question from the audience, but I would like to ask something that I thought of earlier when you were giving your talk. And you talked about spirituality as a driving force for the work that you do, um, but also sort of both, uh, I guess, spirituality as a healing force and also as a liberating force. And I was interested to hear if you had some more thoughts on that, that you could share some more, maybe dive into that a little bit deeper and what that might look like. Sure. So, I mean, so every tribe, so there's how many federally recognized tribes now? Uh, is it 500 and, gosh, I forgot, 586? Or I always get, is it 568 or 586? Anyways, if we don't count the ones who are not federally recognized, but who are inherently sovereign, let's say 600 people in peoples in currently within U.S. borders. And all of those have different religious traditions that are um, sometimes a merger of indigenous traditions and some form of Christianity or are plainly Christian. Um, and some are fundamentally indigenous, you know, um, whatever they are, you know. Um, so in that sort of mix of existence, I would say, those ways of being, they're, they're, it's not always great, right? So um, there is still internalized oppression around religion in Indian country. We were, the Indian, Indian Religious Freedom Act was only signed in what, 19, oh geez, I wanna say 78, but I'm just, maybe I'm transposing my numbers again. <laughs> it could be 87, but it was very recent, you know, that native peoples could be um, punished by, this, by law for, you know, practicing a peyote summary, uh, ceremony, for going to Native American church, for practicing their religion. And so in many ways, Native and Indigenous religions are still very covert. They're still very secret. And we're still trying to revitalize them. So I'm, I'm thinking about um, sort of a mentor in my life. He, uh, he's uh, from Bishop Paiute, but was talking about the revitalization of the bear dance amongst some of the California Native tribes throughout the Sierras, you know, and how you just have to you just have to be part of that in group. You just have to show up and be there to be part of that, you know? And um, I, you know, um, don't particularly, I, I mean, I've never really, there's, there's few professors, Native and Indigenous professors in the U.S. who have brought up these topics in the university. You know, uh, Tink, George Tinker, uh, Tink at, um, uh, I think he's at Denver University, you know, Donald Pixico is one here at ASU. There's a few people who bring up these topics and have the conversations, but because academia is so very secular or it's a uh, very Western in orientation, it's almost impossible to have the conversations without some kind of like um, uh, debasement or a subjugation about it. You know, it's, it feels like becoming exotified, you know, to talk about what that spirituality means. So as when it comes to liberation, it's not only that it's a spiritual practice that is uh, pre-colonial, you know, and therefore a vehicle away from sort of the oppressive parts of um, large organized religions, but um, it's also that it's literally still has to be maintained in secret. You know, so it is, it is literally like, okay, this is this very foundation of my identity is still something I have to keep secret from the state. I have to keep it secret from my colleagues, from my workplace, from my relatives. Um, I'm not allowed to smudge in buildings, you know, it's so the liberation is, it's not just that it's like a, a personal freeing, like a self-realization or self-awareness practice or grounding practice. It's also, um, about being conscientious of, of, you know, um, the rule of law against, <laughs> against your, your right to believe, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and this is particularly the situation when your religion is tied to earth and to land, you know, prayer places, um, like up north, you know, the snowball controversy, you know, skiers want snow on these mountains, these sacred mountains, these sacred peaks. But how can you orient your ceremonies and, and spiritual practices when there's this artificial snow there? Because the spiritual practices are based on observing, you know, the seasonal landscape and developing relationships therein. You know, so those kind of those kind of conversations are, um, I still think, really predominantly maintained among Native people in Indian country. 
somewhat away from universities. I, students talk about it when you have a large mass of native students together, but um, yeah, it's, you know, it's, and it's, 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 I, it really troubles me, actually. Um, we have a whole school of sustainability at ASU and um, that we cannot have conversations about native spirituality and traditional knowledge in that space is, you know, like, what are you sustaining? Are you sustaining, you know, the plunder, you know, let's reserve this earth so that we can just make a better green city in the future for more humans who are just gonna just reserve that earth then, that bit of earth for another green city over here, you know? Like, what are you sustaining? So, um, but that's my, that's my thought. I don't know if that um, answers your question. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I was mostly just interested in hearing you sort of talk about what that would look like. I, I really, um, when we talk about liberatory practice or praxis, um, one of the things that is really difficult, uh, just, I mean, I, I guess it's, a, it's the state of the world almost all the time, but in sort of acute moments, right? Like, like now when um, the violence is so much in your face and it, you can't really get away and it's, it's coming from all sides, it becomes really difficult to think. Liberation feels very unattainable. Um, and so one thing that you said earlier that really resonated with me was that liberation is in the everyday yeah, um, and in sort of the small moments and in, and you were talking about um, sort of the celebrations of ancestors that, that you all do and, and that sort of thing. And it's just, um, I think it was just something that, that resonated with me, this idea that if we're talking sort of liberation on this mass sort of scale, large scale, um, it's really easy to become um, sort of disillusioned and give up, right? Because it feels impossible. Uh, but if we're thinking about it in the way that you're talking about it in the everyday, and I feel like spirituality is kind of tied to that everydayness of it all, even though the sacred has sort of these, um, yep. you know what I mean? I do. Um, it's still very much part of the everyday. I think that just resonated. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Um, yeah. So if you remember um, Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail, he writes in there about the four sort of pathway or the four steps preceding um, a march. Mm -hmm. And one of them is first, there's a fact finding, like, let's just see, let's just lay out all the facts, what happened, who did what, how, when, all this. And then it's followed by a sort of a, an acknowledgement of that. And what is our stance? A plan is made for what kind of action they're going to take, whether it's a boycott or a sit in or a march or whatever. And then there's a process of spiritual purification. And for, for them, spiritual purification was, was Christian, right? And, uh, and they, they did prayer, and, but it was also physical. They um, would um, really contemplate what it is to be beaten or sprayed with water ho fire hose and determine deep inside, I'm not going to react. I'm not going to hit back, you know, and because this is nonviolence. And that, that is precisely what the water protectors at No Dapple were talking about. You know, and at Idle No More, they did not call them protest marches or protest rallies. They called them prayer rallies. Mm -hmm. And women showed up. This is why the indigenous matriarch thing comes in. They showed up in their ribbon skirts. They showed up in skirts. You know, they didn't show up in fatigues. <laughs> you know, they showed up in skirts and they brought their children, their babies, and they, um, had their drums and they had their, you know, their, their hair long, you know, I, I, I grew up in these places where, you know, when girls, as girls, when we get into fights, it's like Vaseline, take your rings off, take your earrings off, tie your hair up, you know, wear basketball shorts and like go at it. But that is not how these women showed up to the Idle No More rallies. They showed up beautiful and, you know, belonging to their families and they showed up to sing. They didn't show up chanting, you know, about, um, these very like um, violent sort of oppositional slogans they sang and it just opens up another part of the spirit yeah and so that that is fundamentally what I think that's about I in faculty meetings I practice the spirituality all the time um, because there is such a, um, a bitterness and a toxic sort of set of it's a culture of complaint in academia 
mm. because we're all very smart and we're all very determined. We all are sure that we are right. But um, when you're sort of at the end of things, you know, and realizing that you're living through an apocalypse, you know, it doesn't matter if you're right. You know, um, I, I know that I share this experience with many people of color, you know, um, nobody is going to, um, the state is not going to harm me because of some political talk that I gave. They're going to harm me because of my skin color. And that's it. And so at that point, I'm not so concerned with being right in the moment. I'm concerned with being kind, you know, and compassionate and understanding where people are coming from. So that, that's the spirituality every day. It's an act of serenity. Um, yeah. And quite frankly, it also protects me from addiction, which is the scourge of historical trauma. So, yeah. Well, I, that was incredible. I feel rejuvenated. And um, I think that's a perfect point for us to stop. We're right on time. So I want to, again, thank you so much for joining us, Marissa. Um, this was uh, such a healing experience for me. So I'm really happy and I'm sure our audience as well. Um, and so um, with that, I, I would like to sign off. Before I do though, I do want to remind everyone that our next talk is going to be on the 18th of November with uh, Dr. Michelle Tellez. Um, and I encourage you all to join us again. Um, you'll see the flyers going around uh, soonish uh, and uh, join us. And thank you. Have a great, wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.